Hello there and welcome back to session number three of the Love of God teaching series. And this session is entitled God's Dream for Man, part one. Guess what the title of the next session would be? It will be God's Dream for Man, part two. You guessed it right. Uh, so now if we remember what we learned last time in our last session, we discussed and talked extensively about the person of wisdom, which we found out that was who? It was Jesus Christ or the Word of God. And we found out from Proverbs 8 that wisdom was God's daily delight. And the daily delight of wisdom was to be with the sons of men. In other words, Jesus' daily delight was to be with us, with us humans, to be with us people. And he participated. He was the master craftsman when God the Father created the world, they, they created it together and created all those details. And then we see in Genesis 3 that something went wrong. And Adam and Eve fell into sin and passed down their sin to the whole human race. But even in that hopeless situation, in that sadness of separation between man and God, Jesus Christ, the voice that was walking in the garden, made a promise right there. Instead of getting angry, he promised in Genesis 3.15 that he will come again in the form of a human being and he will make war with Satan and deliver the human race from the controlling power and the domination of evil and of Satan. So that's great. That's a great and wonderful promise from Jesus Christ. And we see his love, his compassion. And we'll continue today to see that throughout the whole Bible. Bible, and I'll take you from Genesis to the Revelation to Zechariah in the Old Testament first and then in part two in the New Testament in next session. We'll take you from the beginning to the end of the Bible and we'll see the same thing. We'll see God's dream for man. What is his dream for the human race? So now let's open up, uh, Genesis 126 and let's uh, connect from last session to this new session. And let's read together. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, English Version, but you can read from whatever English translation you have available. Let's read it together. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created us, created humans in, in his image and in his likeness. And God was looking, when he did that, he was looking for someone to love. He was looking for someone to be like him, to relate to him in the same way, to afford rulership and authority. He was looking for someone to bless and to be with, to dwell with, to love and to be loved. And we weren't created, as we saw last night, for a selfish motive. Like God was, was, uh, bore, uh, was getting bored and he was desperate and self-pitied. No, 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 no. He was self-sufficient. He is always self-sufficient. He doesn't need anyone to be satisfied or to be, um, to be full of joy and to be, to be by himself. But we weren't created for a selfish motive. And we were made, he made everything for us. He created everything that we see for us and for our benefit. And we, then we saw in Proverbs 8, 30 to 31. And let's read it again together. Then I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world. And my delight was with the sons of men. Of men. Just as the prophets and even David in Psalms, would speak the words of Jesus before he came. We see Solomon here speaking the words of Jesus from heaven by revelation, by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So now today we, we continue to see how God were, uh, is looking in the, the Old Testament. He begins to look for friends so that he can fulfill the promise that he made in Genesis 3.15. So he's looking for friends on the earth. He's searching for friends on the earth with whom to connect with and to bless them and to bless and to continue and to bring his promise to fulfillment that a savior would come for the human race. So who does he find first? We go to Genesis chapter 5 verses 21 to 24 and we see that God finds Enoch. 
Let's read it together, verses 21 to 24. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So God found a friend. His name was Enoch, Enoch, and Enoch walked with God 300 years. Can you imagine that? We don't even live that long today. We live maybe 80, 100, 120, some people, but 300 years he walked with God. We see that in verse 2. That's a lot, a lot of time. But they walk together in friendship. And in Hebrews 11:5, the Bible says that Enoch, Enoch pleased God. Let's see that together. Uh, 11.5 Hebrews. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. In other words, he was God's delight. He had intimacy with God and he had friendship, close friendship with God. And then after Enoch... We see in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, that the world again uh, went away from God and they started doing evil. Let's read together 5 to 8. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see here, the Lord is sorry. I think it takes a long time to make the Lord sorry for something. And here we see that the world went so evil Every day, continually, every intent of the thought uh, of their thoughts was of the of the thoughts of their hearts were towards evil in such a way that God became sore and He wanted to destroy men. But He had made a promise in Genesis three fifteen that He would come and save men. So He couldn't He couldn't have destroyed men because of His promise. So what did God do? He let he let it go he let people go he let the world go until he found one man he found another man noah uh, well, about whom the bible says that he found grace in the eyes of the lord he found favor and noah became friend with god god became friend with noah and uh, during noah god decided to de still destroy the whole earth destroy kill all people and I want you to understand that he was not being mean when he did that, when he brought the flood. It hurt to destroy his creation. He, God has emotions. It's not something that he enjoyed doing, but he had to do that. But still, he kept a man with his own family. A man found grace. His name was Noah. And through that man, God was able to continue to be on the earth, to continue. The, the promise that he made in Genesis had a hope now. And then we see in Genesis 12, chapter, chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, that God finds another friend. So Noah passed, uh, he went to be with the Lord. And then we see in Genesis 12, the Bible says this. Now the Lord had said to Abram, the new friend is Abram. Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful deal and covenant God is doing here with his friend Abram. And notice, was Abraham asked to be a servant? When God came to him, was he asked to be a servant to God? No, not at all. God wanted to bless him. Look at God's desire and eagerness to, if you may, eagerness to bless Abraham. To, he said, I will bless you and I will curse anyone who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. 
I want to bless you, Abraham. Abraham. And then his name was changed to Abraham. And it says, in all the families will be blessed. And Isaiah 41 verse 8 says, refers, refers to Abraham like, uh, as to his friend. Abraham was God's friend. So we see that God keeps looking for friendship, friendship so that he would fulfill his promise from Genesis 3.15. And now we'll, uh, we will uh, fast forward a little bit the story of how Abraham becomes Israel and they go to Egypt. So Abraham... Uh, as um, many of you may know, he had two sons, one from uh, a servant uh, named Ishmael, which was not the promise, the one promised by God. And then another one, a son of the son of the promise called Isaac. And Isaac uh, had another son. Isaac had uh, a, in his turn, he had a son too called Jacob. And the blessing of Abraham that God gave Abraham passed down to Isaac and then to Jacob, who later became Israel. Jacob, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And Jacob, or Israel, had 12 sons. And all these 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. And among those 12 sons, Jacob had a son named Joseph. And Joseph was... Uh, Jacob's favorite son, one of the one of his favorites, because later on we see Benjamin also being his favorite. But Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob, and he even gave him a coat, and he favored him among all his brothers. Um, and all the his brothers were envious and jealous on Joseph. And Joseph, on top of all these things, he has two dreams: one in which he sees all his brothers bowing down to him. And then if that wasn't enough, he has another dream and he even makes the mistake, like we many times do, to tell it to his brothers, to tell those dreams to his brothers and to his parents. And the sec in the second dream, even his parents, the sun and the moon, were bound before him. And we will see later that these dreams will come, will, will come true, will be fulfilled. But it wasn't the time there and then to, for him to tell those dreams and um, him telling those dreams generated even more envy, more jealousy from his brothers. So one day his brothers went far away with the sheep, with the herds to, to feed them. And uh, Jacob, the father, calls Joseph and sends him to his brothers with food, with uh, clothing, just to, to, to check on his brother, to see how they are, where they are. So Joseph, innocent Joseph, takes all this food and the clothing and goes searching for his brothers. And finally he finds his brothers and his brothers, because of the envy and jealousy that they had on him, they decide to, at first to kill him, but then one of the older brothers says, brothers, don't kill him. This is a sin from God. Let's, let's sell him to a, to a caravan. Let's sell him to the Egyptians. So they sell him to a, an Egyptian caravan that was going to Egypt. They sell him for money. Can you imagine that? To sell your own brother for money. That's human trafficking right, right there. But he gets, uh, in that way, he arrives into Egypt in the house of Potiphar. He starts serving there and Potiphar sees him and, and he perceives that the favor of God was with Joseph because everything that Joseph touched was blessed and was flourishing. And then we have the episode when Potiphar's wife tries to tempt Joseph to sleep with him and Joseph refuses and for that he goes to prison. And there he spends another 10 or 11 years in prison and he tries to get out by uh, interpreting some dreams of, of some of the servants of Pharaoh. But they forget about him and finally after so many years when probably Joseph forgot about his family, forgot about his dreams, about, his, uh, about the destiny of his life. One day Pharaoh has a, a dream about seven cows that were, that were fat, about seven cows that were thin, and then a second dream about uh, grains. And, and he, he is troubled about those two dreams. And he, he, asked his, he asked his magicians to interpret those dreams, but nobody could interpret those dreams. So he calls, Potiphar tells Pharaoh, I know a man, I know a person who can interpret your dreams. 
So uh, not not Potiphar, the um, the cupbearer of Pharaoh said he remembered Joseph from prison when he interpreted his own dreams. He remembered Joseph and he told Pharaoh, "Call Joseph because Joseph will be able to interpret your dreams." So Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams. That, uh, and he tells Pharaoh that there will be seven years of blessings, seven years of plentiful, of abundance, and then seven years of famine. And then they will have to save for those seven years of famine, save food, save provisions so that they will be able to survive. So in that way, Joseph becomes the king, becomes second after Pharaoh, becomes very high. Uh, 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 he obtains a high position in Egypt. Uh, almost like the king, like the pharaoh. And he lives many, many years uh, well until the famine comes. The seven years of famine come. And that famine spread, spread so much that it reached to the regions where his own family lived. Where Jacob with all the other brothers lived. So the famine reached there too. So they had to, they were forced to come to Egypt. They heard that there was food in Egypt. So they came in Egypt. For food and they didn't recognize Joseph but Joseph recognized it recognized them he gave them food and then uh, to make the story short they the whole family Jacob the whole family moves to Egypt in Goshen in a very nice area in Egypt and Joseph takes care of them for many years and they live a, a good life for many years as the Pharaoh's favorites but then there, there comes a time when another Pharaoh rises to power and that Pharaoh didn't know Joseph. And the people of Israel multiplied so much. And they had sons and daughters that the Egyptians became fearful of them. That they that uh, Israel might come against them. So what, what did Pharaoh do? They decided, the Pharaoh and Egypt decided to make Israel, the people of Israel, slaves. And they, they came into slavery and they been in, and they were in slavery for 400 years. And after 400 years, the people of Israel cried out to God for salvation, to, to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob for salvation. And God raises up a savior, raises up Moses uh, uh, to, to come and save them. To take them out, to take them out of Egypt, and he, Joseph, uh, Moses comes, and with all those ten plagues, he he tells Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let my people go, let my people go. So after ten plagues, after God, after uh, the ten plagues, after God kills the firstborn of every Egyptians in the land, finally Pharaoh lets the, allows the people of Israel to leave Egypt, but not in just any way. But with, with a lot of riches, a lot, they plundered Egyptians because they went to their neighbors and asked for the gold, asked for the silver, asked for everything they had. And Egyptians just told them, take everything with you, just go, go. And they took and they plundered Egypt, uh, the Egyptians. So they went out of Egypt with a lot of wealth. So we come in Exodus chapter 19 verses 4 to 5 and we read this. God says here, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Do you remember from last session when Jesus said, I will bring you to myself. So I brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine. In other words, it says, I delivered you. You are my special treasure. You are my daily delight. If you remember the, the, the other expression. I brought you two things here. I brought you to myself to be with. Uh, he wanted to be with us. And then second thing, I want you to keep my covenant, keep my voice, keep my commands. And you shall be to me a special treasure. God again is looking for his people that he can bless and love and who can be his daily delight. And then we continue in Exodus 25 verse 8 says this. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then chapter 29 verses 44 to 46. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. 
I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God and brought them up out of the land of Egypt that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Here's an amazing part of the story where we see the God of heaven, the creator God who lives in heaven in the beautiful heaven, comes to these slaves from Egypt who are now in the desert, in the dry desert, in the uh, hot desert, and tells them, hey, make me a tent. God comes from his heaven and he wants to live in a tent with the people of Israel in the hot desert to live with them because he wants to be with them. He said, I want to be with you. Make me a tent, make me a tabernacle where I may dwell with you. Do you see God's desire here? He, he is willing to leave his heaven and actually he did. He came into a cloud and lived in the tabernacle, on top of the tabernacle, and lived, dwelled with the people of Israel. And in Le Leviticus, God is making a deal with the people of Israel. In Leviticus chapter 26, verses 1 to 13, says this, You shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves, nor, sh nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your, in your land to bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You, will eat, you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousands to flight. Thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you, for I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. The eternal God wants to be with them, wants to be with us still. He says, I will be their God. He says, I will bless you. I will give you victory. I will give you success. I will give you victory over your enemies. I will set my tabernacle among you. I want to dwell with you. I am the Lord your God. And I want to dwell with them, not in heaven, but here with them. Today we have a few more, uh, we have a little bit more, uh, many scriptures to read. But uh, that's so good to read the word of God and, and go through the whole Old Testament and see the love of God throughout the whole story. Numbers chapter 13 verses 1 to 3 and verse 23 says this. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the children of Israel. And then verse 23. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. And uh, let's see further on verses in the same chapter 13 verses 26 to 33. Now they departed and came back to Moses, uh, Moses and Aaron and all of the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. 
The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of An Anak, come, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Look here, the Lord God promised to them this land, this promised land, the Canaan, where God says it flows with milk and honey. And the spies, the 12 spies go uh, together with Joshua and Caleb, and they bring news from the land. And notice that out of 12, 10 was, uh, brought a bad report, and uh, a report lacking faith, and just two of them were full of faith. And they said, we are well able to overcome it. If God is for us, if God is, uh, is for us, no one can stand against us. We will eat them. Doesn't matter who is there. Doesn't matter what giants are there. It doesn't matter who is there. The Lord promised us and he will give it to us. But look at verse 27. What does milk and honey mean? Do you think they were like going to the land and, and walking through milk and honey saying, and being all sticky and with milk and honey? No, 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 no. If they, what, they, what does milk and honey mean? They, if they surely didn't have rivers of milk and honey flowing all over the place in, in the land. But a land that flows with milk and honey signified two important things. First, to have a lot of milk, it meant that you had a lot of cows and herds. So when God said the land flows with milk, it meant they were going to have lots of herds and flocks and cattle. And they knew that they not only had milk, but together with those animals came meat, came industry, came business, came jobs, came uh, wealth. So it, uh, a land with milk, it meant uh, what they heard when they heard uh, that God promised them a land where uh, flowing with milk, it meant business, it meant wealth, it meant industry. That's what they heard in that time. I know that for our, uh, in our time, in the modern times, farming is not such a big deal. We have people doing that and they bring the milk to our shops and to our uh, grocery shops and we can find it almost everywhere. Uh, if you are in one of the blessed countries where there's abundance, there are countries where you cannot find it so well. But to them in that time, it meant, like for us, would mean today big businesses, big business, big money. And second, to have a lot of honey meant you had bees. And what do bees do? They pollinate. So they pollinated, they pollinate the crops. And if you had a lot of bees, you had a lot of crops better than other people's crops if you had bees. In the United States, uh, there is a statistic that there are, are about 90 types, 90 crops that need to be pollinated by bees. And what they do is they rent these beehives from, from bee farmers just for the purpose of pollination. So when the Bible says that this land was flowing with honey, it meant, that it, it meant an abundance of crops, better crops than anywhere else. And it meant abundance. So this is what milk and honey meant for the people of Israel. Now let's move on to Numbers 14, chapter 14, verses 1 to 11, where the Bible says this. We'll continue our story. Isn't that exciting? So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. Why? They were sad because of the bad report. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, so sad to hear the people of Israel saying that when they had such a great God, such a wonderful and powerful God. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? 
Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. Look at what words of faith come from Caleb's mouth and Joshua's mouth. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? How long they will reject me? How long they will not believe me? Isn't that the same thing that we do today so many times? Reject God knowingly or unknowingly or uh, do not believe God. Look at verse 22 and verse 23. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. Verse 29 and 31. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who are numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. Except for Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. You shall by no means enter the land which I saw I would make you dwell in. But your little ones whom you said would be victims I will bring in. And they shall know the land which you have despised. See here, the Lord has so much patience. Patience. Ten times they tested the Lord. And the Lord didn't do anything the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, and so on until ten times. Uh, God has been rejected and people murmured and people were in unbelief. And they even wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb for their faith. Can you imagine that? Now, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been rejected? Has anyone talked unfairly about you or misjudged you or misjudged your character? How did you feel when that happened? The people of Israel here did that to God and not only one time, but ten times. Now all that first generation has died and we're moving on now to the second generation. But we see that God remains the same. He remains faithful. So one generation passes, dies in the desert, except the two who had faith, Joshua and Caleb. And we can see and we, we will see all over the Bible that the majority is not always right. But uh, the minority is most of the times right and it's on, the, on God's side. So we come to Israel, Israel's second generation in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 1 to 8. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess... And has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgasites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the uh, Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. Nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved image, images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. A special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. 
The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you are the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, but because the Lord loves you, but because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Amen. And Deuteronomy 14, verse 2. For you are a holy people again to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. I want to be with you in love. That's what God tells the pe people the, the, to the people of Israel. God would be, you almost have the impression that he would be embarrassed of how humble his being towards his people. He humbles before his people and he tells them, I want to be not in a begging mode, not in a, bang, uh, a begging attitude, but he loves them so much and he wants to show them love and blessing. And this is the, the story of, uh, uh, of um, the salvation of the people of Israel from Egypt. is one of the most rehearsed stories in the Bible. Uh, the salvation from Egypt and leading of the people of Israel into the promised land. Out of two reasons, at least two reasons. One, it is because it's a very dear story to God's heart. It's a story of how God took these people from slavery and took them to the promised land. And second, it is a typology of salvation that it, it was going to happen years in the future of how we were saved from sin, which is symbolized by Egypt, and born again and given salvation, which is the promised land. Promised land is not heaven after death. The promised land is here with us. It's a spiritual land. It's a, it's a land of inheritance. It's a land of, of blessing for for the children of God, for those who accepted Jesus Christ in their hearts, for those who are born again in the family of God. And we see this story that we just, uh, we just uh, narrated. Uh, it is, uh, it is, we see this story again in Psalm 78, verses 1 to 60. And we see from, let's pick it up from verse 5. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Verse 10. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. Marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers, in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. Look at verse 13. He divided the sea. And caused them to pass through. And he made the water stand up like a heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud. And all the night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness. And gave them drink in abundance like the death. He also brought streams out of the rock. And caused waters to run down like rivers. Verse 17. But they sinned even more against him. By rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for the fruit of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Look how mock, how mock, what mockery they brought before God. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rocks so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Therefore, the Lord heard this and was furious. So many times we say, this God doesn't do this and doesn't do that. How come this God does do this? How come, how come this God allows this? Look, God, the Lord heard this and became furious. So fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up, up against Israel. Because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. Yet he had commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven, had rained down manna on them to eat, and given them the bread of heaven. Man ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He also rained meat on them like the dust, feathered fowl like the sand of the seas. And he let them fall in the midst of their camp. 
all around their dwellings. So they ate and were well filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not deprived of their craving, but while their food was still in their mouths, the wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck down the, choices men, the choice men of Israel. In spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore their days he consumed in, consumed in futility and their years in fear. When he slew them, then they sought him and they returned and sought earnestly for God. Then they remembered that God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth and they lied to him with their tongue. Can you see what treatment God got from these people? For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. But he, but he, verse 38, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Look at God's heart. It's the same heart today for us. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. I think we already heard this word grieve so many times by now. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. I like this one, limited the Holy One of Israel. We can limit God for our unbelief. Although God can, uh, has given us so many things, everything pertaining to life and godliness, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, we people can limit Him through our unbelief, through our provo provoking. They did not remember His power. The day when he redeemed them from the enemy, when he worked his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan, turned their rivers into blood and their streams that they could not drink. He sent swarms of fleas, flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed them. It's, it's talking here about the ten plagues. He also gave their crops to the caterpillar and their labor to the locust. He destroyed their wines, their vines with hail, and their sycamore trees with frost. He also gave up their cattle to the hail and their flocks to fiery lightning. Verse 52. But he made his own people go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them on safely so, led them on safely so that they did not fear. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies. 55. He also drove out the nations before them, allotted them an inheritance by survey, and made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents. Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God and did not keep His testimonies, but turned back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like, deceit, like a deceitful bow, for they provoked Him to anger with their high places and moved Him to jealousy with their carved images. When God heard this, He was furious and greatly abhorred Israel, so that He forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh the tent he had placed among them. So God brought in this second generation, brought the second generation to the promised land and drove out all the enemies from the land, from their midst. They, now they don't have to pay rent to anybody. They own their own land. They are no longer slaves. They are managers. They are CEOs, if you want. They own businesses. Everything belongs to them. But after a few years, they forget about the Lord. So many times we forget about God, about what He did good in our lives, about the good things in our lives. And we forget to thank Him and to appreciate Him and to be grateful to Him. So they forgot God. They started going to the hills and bowing down to the carved images instead of the living God. And God's heart, we see, was so injured, so grieved. But His love makes Him relentless made him relentless his love because he loves them he got to the point where the bible says he abhorred israel but because of his love god will not give up on them and god will never give up on you in fact he already demonstrated he already proved that that he gave his only son his daily delight he gave it for us he sacrificed it for us he will not give up on you even when you mess up badly, even when you sin the worst, there is a chance. 
there is, a, there is always a way back to the Father. Psalm 81 verse 8 to 16 says this, Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you, O Israel, if you will listen to me. There shall be no foreign God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people will not heed my voice, and Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. Verse 13, oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also with finest of wheat and with honey from the rock. I would have satisfied you. And then we, we, if we move to Jeremiah 31, to Ezekiel 37, we see that the Lord promises, still promises. Uh, for instance, Jeremiah 31, uh, the, verse 33. Let's take it from verse 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write, the, write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. He's like, he's, he's like an unbroken record. He, always, they will be my people and I shall be their God. They will be with me. I will bring them to myself. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Ezekiel 37 verses 21 to 28. Then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into kingdoms again. Uh, verse 24. David my servant shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe, observe my statutes and do them. Verse 26, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that the Lord sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. God is looking to make his abode, his home, his dwelling with us people. And we will see in the New Testament that the human body, our human body has indeed become the temple, the tabernacle of God. And we see this, my people, I will be their God in, two, in 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen race. You are a chosen generation. You are my chosen people. God, Je God, Jesus, longs for a people to love Him. This is His dream, to, uh, to have a people that will love Him back, that He will love, that He would bless, that He would be with, that He would spend time with, and they would love Him back. He, he longs for a people that would be His delight. And then in the, in the last book of the Old Testament, in Zechariah chapter 2, verse, verses 10 to 11, so many years has pa have passed through the, all the major and minor prophets of the men of God and centuries have passed by. And in Zechariah chapter 2 verses 10 to 11, it's like Jesus, God, breaks through the fabric of time and tells the, His people, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they shall become my people, and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. 
It's like God saying, you may have forgotten me. You, have may, you may have forgotten what I've done for you about my promise in Genesis, but I have not forgotten about you. I have not forgotten about you. Sing and rejoice because I am coming. I am coming. What I promised in Genesis 3.15, I will fulfill. I'm coming to save you. I'm coming to bring you back. I'm coming to win you back so that you would be my people, to bring you to myself. So that I would dwell with you. So that I will love you. So that I will bless you. So that I will forget all your iniquities. All your sins. So that I would have fellowship with you. That's this God's desire. To be with us. To have fellowship with us. To have friendship with us. And Jesus is looking forward to his coming. In the New Testament. And that's where we'll continue in the next session. Saying I want to be with you. That's God's dream for man. I want to be with you. Because... I love you. Until we meet again, may God bless you and let these words sink in into your heart. Meditate on them. Let them penetrate your heart and meditate on how much God loves you, how much His compassion is for you, how much He wants to bless you. And when you face a difficulty, I don't know why, but uh, whenever we face difficulties and trials, the first thing we think as the source of that evil is God. God allowed me to go through this. God made me do this. God, this God. Why don't we think of Satan? Why don't we think of other people? Because we have free will. You have a free will. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't like to be a robot. You have a free will. And there's Satan who is an adversary. Why would you think that God did something evil to you or allowed something evil to happen to you? God is love and He loves you. Don't forget that. Let, let His love Fill your heart and then your heart will respond to him with love, back with love. You, it will be easy to love him back, to submit to him, to obey him, to do his will, to please him. Because you know now how much he loves you. Amen. Amen.